Hello everyone and welcome to Uncivil Law. For today's case, we have a situation where a criminal defendant was not provided certain information that they are required to be provided and they are challenging their conviction as a result. This is the case of Tina Jimmers Jimerson versus Dexter Payne, the director of the Arkansas Department of Corrections. In this case, a person was convicted but wasn't provided all the information they are required to be provided and they are suing for relief. So let's discuss this and let's get started with this. Myrtle Holmes was found deceased in the trunk of her car parked at her home in 1988. On March the 16th, 1990, Charlie Vaughn Brown and Ren Renald Early were charged in state court with this capital murder. The state alleges the three men had acted together in committing various offenses and in the course of those offenses had caused death under circumstances manifesting extreme indifference to the value of, half of human life. So yes, this is enhanced This is enhanced murder, so we are looking at capital charges here. Approximately one year later, Vaughn pled guilty to the first degree murder. The guilty plea implicated Brown and Early. Vaughn's plea also led to Jimerson being charged as accomplished in a separate indictment. The trial court consolidated the cases for trial. The investigations undertaken on behalf of the criminal suspects since their convictions revealed a number of unusual facts about the case. So these people were all being charged and they're ultimately convicted. And after the fact, they've hired some private investigators to look into it. And the private investigators have turned up some things that make their convictions a little less certain. So let's talk about these things that happened. The law enforcement undisclosed use of informant against Ronnie Prescott. An undisclosed recorded conf confession by a co-defendant. An undisclosed photo lineup identified by Brown. Both Jimerson and Early were represented at trial by the same attorneys. An undisclosed close familial relationship between a witness who had been sentenced to 20 years for a drug conviction and the sheriff who released the victim under just two years later under a jail trustee program. So this person had been sentenced to 20 years and they only got two because of their close relationship. And that's a thing. An undisclosed relationship between the family of informant Tara Bryant, who had provided critical information on trial and Holmes' private investigator, witnesses that admitted to being so heavily under the influence of drugs at the time that they had no recollection of their trial testimony. So that's good. They're testifying while high. That's great. So they can't even remember what they testified to because they were not mentally competent at the time they testified. That's good news. Co-defendants uh, early signed the affidavit assuming sole responsibility for the crime. So that's a thing. One guy said, I'm solely responsible. We didn't disclose that. And an individual who was interviewed by law enforcement in 1990 has denied under oath they provided incriminating information contained in the report. So there were a whole bunch of problems here in this. The, the police didn't disclose a whole bunch of things. There was a confession by one of them that wasn't disclosed. One of them said it was solely me. They didn't disclose that. The witnesses were high when they testified, but we didn't tell you about that, even though we knew about it. And one of the witnesses was sentenced to 20 years, but only got two because he happens to be related to the sheriff. What are the odds? So yeah, there were a whole bunch of things where these people are being you know, criminally convicted of capital murder and a bunch of things that we didn't tell you about that might have been relevant to your defense in some way. So these might pose some problems. When Jimerson, one of the criminal defendants, was charged a couple days after one of his co-defendants' guilty plea, this guy's attorney, who also represented a different defendant, so he represents two people, filed discovery motions requesting information concerning informants and whether any informants had requested or offered immunity, immunity leniency, sentences, or other charge concessions, or other inducements. So was there anything that, that induced them to testify? He also requested video and audio recordings of any confession. In addition, he asked for any material or information within the prosecution's knowledge, possession, or control, or the hand of any law enforcement agency that could negate the, the guilt of the defendant or could reduce the punishment thereof, which is typical Brady material, right? The then prosecuting attorney responded that the informant referred to as Sam was Tara Bryant, and the only recordings were conversations between two witnesses who were brothers and, vid and video of the crime scene. The prosecutor also stated they had no information of any informant whose information led to or assisting in making an arrest, and no offers of immunity, leniency, sentence concessions, or other inducements were made to any defendant, potential witnesses, or other informant other than the offer made to Vaughn. So basically, they, they lied. They said, yeah, we don't have any inf information regarding video, even though they had it. We don't have any information regarding inducements, even though we know about it. So basically, they didn't give them 
the materials that they asked for. So that's a whole kind of problem. A jury returned guilty verdicts on all the charges and each was sentenced to life imprisonment. In 1994, all the judgments were confirmed by on appeal. So they were given life imprisonment, not capital punishment, but you know, they were all found guilty as a result of these this evidence. Jerryman asserted in her petition that her conviction has been obtained contrary to the 14th Amendment due process clause because the police and prosecution failed to disclose exculpatory or impeaching evidence in violation of Brady and because law enforcement destroyed evidence in bad faith in violation of Arizona versus Youngblood. Okay, so with his criminal conviction in place, he says, you didn't give me information that I was required to be presented under Brady and also you destroyed evidence under a case called Youngtown. And so I'd like to challenge that. So now we have to discuss how the courts, the federal courts in particular, review this because this sentence has already been confirmed by the state court. So now we're in federal court. We're here on a, a, a on the great writ. We're here on the writ of habeas corpus. Please justify why I'm being held in jail. And federal courts have a limited role in reviewing habeas because of various statutes that are in place. So we're going to look at this and see how the federal court analyzes this. This isn't a direct appeal. You know, he already appealed through the state system. So he already had his direct appeals. This is a collateral attack. So we're coming at it in a different lawsuit. You know, so this is not the state versus him. This is him versus the, the prisoner. He's versus his jailer. Why am I being held in jail? So this is a collateral attack. And because it's a collateral attack on a writ of habeas corpus, we have to review the standards that go into that. So let's do that. Under the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act, habeas petitioners have one year from the latest of four triggering events to file a petition for a writ of habeas corpus. The state has asserted both these petitions are time barred. Brown and Jimerson contend their positions were timely under the statute, which starts the limitation period as of the date on which the factual predicate of the claim or claims presented could have been discovered through the exercise of due diligence. The factual predicate of the claim also constitutes vital facts underlying those claims. So under federal law, you do have a writ of habeas corpus, but you have to bring it within certain time periods, namely a year. And so the question is, well, when do those time periods start and when do they end? And did they end in respect to any of these complaints? So let's read on. We conclude the factual predicate for the Brady complaint, the young blood claim, and the actual innocence claim develop at different times. So there's different claims. They have different time periods. So different evidence is available for them. Jimerson discovered the vital facts of her actual innocence claim when early confessed in 2015 to being the sole perpetrator of the crime. Jimerson brought her actual innocence claim in an amended petition filed just over a month after early signed this affidavit confessing to the crimes. To the extent a freestanding actual innocence claim may be recognized in habeas, Jermison filed an actual innocence claim within one year of the date a factual predicate was discovered, if cognizable, would be timely. So we first have to discuss the Brady complaint and discuss when its time periods lapse. So when did you know about the fact that you were not provided certain material? So when did that time period run? To establish the Brady violation, Jimmerman must show the prosecution suppressed evidence that was favorable to her and material to either guilt or punishment. Evidence is material if there is a reasonable probability that, had the information been disclosed to the defense, the resulting prosecution would have been different. Before Jimmerson's private investigator spoke with the sheriff, Jimmerson had no way of knowing that law enforcement recruited the assistance of another prisoner to act as an informant, the law enforcement provided the means to record the conversation, and the informant's cooperation would result in a complete dismissal of that informant's pending charge. So we gave that guy a walk. So we, that would have been something that would have been helpful to know. Jimerson's counsel served broad discovery requests on the prosecutor regarding the informant and anyone else who had been offered leniency, sentencing, or charging or other inducement. So we had asked for this material and we didn't get it. So that would have been fine. The prosecution's file did not contain the tape recording made of Prescott or any other information induce, indicating law enforcement had used Prescott to obtain information from Vaughn about the murder. As found by the magistrate judge, there's no question the prosecutor's responses were, in this case, misleading at best and arguably untruthful. So yeah, there, were, there was a whole bunch of information. We didn't tell you about the part of the criminal, go of the criminal suspect who we used, who we gave a walk. We didn't tell you about that. We didn't tell you about the tapes and stuff. We didn't tell you about that. So there's a whole bunch of things. But the question is, well, when did we learn of that disclosure and are we bringing our complaint too late? Since the identity of the informant was still unknown to Jimerson in January of 2014, Jimerson had not yet obtained vital facts surrounding the claim. 
It's indisputable, however, that once counsel identified the informant by name and talked directly with him, Jermison had discovered the factual predicate for the Brady campaign, the great the Brady claim. So at that point, we knew enough to bring the complaint. Jimerson has not shown anything that would have prevented him from filing a petition alleging a violation after they spoke with Prescott and amending it later if additional information became available. So once you learned the name, in particular once you had that interview, you had enough to file. So that's when your one-year period began. Once you at least had that interview, that's when the period for the Brady thing started. Thus, the limitation period started to run on June the 24th, 2014. And this person filed their petition on June the 30th, 2015. Six days too late. Six days too late. Let you know, that's six days, ma'am. So counsel's negligence in following to fa failing to file this petition is not in extraordinary circumstances, and thus the, the claim is time barred. So, so counsel screwed this one. So counsel screwed this one. So you can go after them for malpractice, but you can't go after the state. So they filed their complaint six days. It's a one-year bar and you filed it six days too late, man. And so that's the end of your complaint on the Brady material. So it's, it's sad that we didn't disclose it to you, but you can't get any relief from the government, maybe from your lawyer, but not from us. So very sad. This is, this is a cautionary tale to lawyers everywhere. Time periods matter. And sometimes when you miss those time periods, you know, there's just nothing left to be done. But fortunately, it may not all be bad news because we do have other causes of action. So let's discuss those causes of action and when those time periods might run. So now we have the timeliness of the young blood claim, and this presents a closer question. Under the young blood, a prosecutor has a duty to preserve potentially useful evidence for trial. Young blood applies to bad faith loss or destruction of evidence. So not only do we have to disclose certain information, we have to preserve the information in order to disclose it. So maybe we have a, a, a claim for you're destroying the evidence. So even though you didn't disclose it to us and that period lost, we've learned about the destruction. And so maybe that gives us a different bite at this apple. So let's try that. Without the recording, we cannot ascertain the significance. We do not know what Prescott said to Vaughn to enlist the confession. We do not know if, Pres if Prescott suggested details. We do not know if the confession was consistent with this in-court confession. We do not know if Vaughn reluctantly and nervously confessed and implicated others, or if he willingly and confidently confessed and implicated others. It could be the recording was merely cumulative and corroborated. It could be the recording demonstrated Vaughn was coerced or influenced to implicate others. What we can conclude on this record is the failure to make any mention of the fact that Prescott recorded conversations with Vaughn in a handwritten statement prepared by one of the law enforcement officers for his signature combined with the failure to disclose the recording is evidence of a conscious efforts to suppress this evidence. This deliberate admission is indicative of bad faith. So we don't know if this information would have been helpful or not because we don't have it because it was destroyed, which is exactly why you're not allowed to destroy it. So it might be, if we had this evidence, we would be able to conclude that it wouldn't have helped. It wouldn't have been material in the end. It would have been merely cumulative. It wouldn't have led to a different conclusion, right? So it would only be available to overturn the verdict if it would, if there's a substantial likelihood it would have come to a different result. So it might be this evidence would not be sufficient to trigger that threshold. So, you know, if we look at the evidence and it's like, oh, you know, it's, it's important, but it wouldn't have come to a different result, then we can safely ignore it. But we don't have it to make that assessment. And that's exactly the problem. We don't have it to make the assessment. So it could be a nothing burger or it could be material, but because you destroyed it, we can't assess that. And so we're going to hold that against you because you're the one who destroyed it. You know, you're responsible for your stuff just as he's responsible for his stuff. So it could be nothing. It could be everything. So we're going to assume it's a lot because you're the one who destroyed it. So we're going to make the presumption against you that this would have been actually super material. So that's going to be a problem. So now we have to figure out if that is available as a cause of action. The factual predicate for this claim was developed on January the 15th, or apologies, January the 7th, 2015. And thus, they assessed this claim within the one-year period. Therefore, the young blood and actual innocence claim are timely, but the Brady camp claim is not. So fortunately, we lost some of it, but not everything because different time periods. So we knew about the Brady and we could have brought that, but we didn't. So we, we, we used it or we lost it. So we lost it. But fortunately, under Youngblood, we found about that evidence later and we, our period had not lapsed. So we, could, so we were able to bring that. So we are able to bring the complaint for destruction of evidence and maybe an actual innocence claim. 
but we can't bring it for failure to disclose. So we do have some causes of relief. Our analysis of the merits of the young blood claim would dovetail with prejudice prongs. So is it meritorious and is it prejudicial? We're going to treat them in the same thing. It's meritorious if it's prejudicial. Since the merits are discussed later in this opinion, we do not repeat those findings other than to note Brown and Jemerson have satisfied this prejudice prong. As to the other prong, Supreme Court is determining that cause is shown when a prosecutor withholds exculpatory evidence, the petitioner reasonably relied on a prosecution's open file policy as fulfilling the duty to disclose, and the state has confirmed the reliance on this policy by asserting the petitioner has already received everything known to the government. Because these people have made a necessary showing of external impediments outside their control that prevent them from raising these claims, including the concealment of evidence, misstatements about the evidence, destruction or loss of evidence, and reliance on this open file policy, prosecutors knew prevent them from disclosing that petitioners have established cause for their habeas claim. The state argues that the bad faith element is absent because all indications are the police and prosecutor thought the in evidence was inculpatory, not exculpatory. So we thought it made you more guilty, not less guilty, which may very well be true, but it would be nice for the defense to be able to say that. The state's argument, however, is unsupported by the record. After law enforcement and the deputy prosecutor dis discussed the recording, the prosecutor advised the recording was inadmissible. The testimony from the sheriff and the chief of police was not that the prosecutor thought the evidence was inculpatory, in other words, it made you more guilty, but that it could not be used or wouldn't have evidentiary value, so in other words, it would be irrelevant. Although the substance of the recording is not entirely clear, what the recording contains appears to be significant enough that law enforcement and the prosecution worked together to intentionally conceal its existence from the defense. Yeah, you had a whole discussion about it, so, you know, maybe they could have made their own assessment. This intent is demonstrated in several ways. One way is the prosecution's decision to provide, at a minimum, misleading answers and perhaps just flat out lies to defense counsel's discovery request, but more accurately classified as untruthful. In other words, it was a lie. In other, another way is the prosecution's decisions not to preserve the recording after he found out about it and opined it was admissible. So we're just going to destroy it because, you know, we don't need it. Ugh. In addition, law enforcement assisted the prosecution's effort to conceal the existence of the recording by putting together a statement for the people to sign that deliberately left out any mention of the recording. So we prepared the statement and we, we've left out that detail for him to sign. So that was, you know, a problem. The existence of this recording was also admitted from the police report, which failed to identify him as an informant, which he was. Taken together, the uncontroverted evidence establishes bad faith. So yeah, not only did we destroy the destroy it, we basically omitted it from everywhere. We were prepared a statement for the for the guy that fully mentioned it. We failed to mention that he was an informant. We failed to disclose we gave him a sweet dart deal. We failed to disclose any of these very, very material things. And then we destroyed the tape. So yeah, it kind of looks like we were concealing evidence. Kind of looks like bad faith. Kind of looks like we were trying to hide the ball. So the court looks like this is like, yeah, no. It looks like you were decidedly trying to hide the ball. This doesn't look like, oh, you just thought it was, you know, just made a little mistake. It's like, no, no, basically he made every possible effort to conceal the fact that this existed. He kept it from the statement. He denied existence of the informant. He denied existence of the deal. He denied existence of the tape. You had an open file policy, which basically, by the way, open file policy is where a prosecutor says, we're not even going to make decisions about what is or is not disclosable. That's an open file policy. And a lot of prosecutors' offices have open file policies. So some will like try to determine what is and is not disclosable under Brady, and some just say, eh, we're not even going to figure it out. You can look at you can literally come in and look at our file. Right? That's an open file policy. You can literally come in and just look at the same file the prosecution has. So you can just come in and look at everything, look at all the things if you want. And None of these things were in the file somehow, even though, you know, none of the discussions, none of these things, they're just, they're just not in the file. So the prosecution says you can look at all the things and then, you know, some of the things aren't in the open file. Way to go. Way, good job, prosecution. That's just outstanding. Under these particular circumstances where the prosecution and law enforcement acted in concert not to conceal the contents of the recording, but also effectively concealed that conversation took place. So not only did we conceal the conversation, we concealed the fact that it took place at all. An adverse inference may be drawn, and it's appropriate to weight this in favor of the criminal defendants. Accordingly, under the O'Neill standard, we're required to treat the constitutional violations as if injurious violations had occurred. Having established these violations that we find grant a substantial and injurious effect, we affirm the grant of habeas relief to Brown and Jimerson.
So that is the end of our coverage of the case of Tina Jimerson versus Dexter Payne, director of Arkansas Department of Correction, because this is a writ of habeas corpus. We are suing the jailer because we are being jailed and we'd like to not be jailed anymore. So that's how you bring a habeas claim. They've already come, went through their criminal prosecution, so it's not direct appeal. This is a collateral appeal. All right, we're trying to attack the case from the side. And the Court of Appeals says, well, there are limitations on this. You have to bring it within certain time periods. So you lose your Brady violation because you didn't bring it in enough time. But fortunately, you did bring some other complaints in enough time, merely, namely the one under Youngblood. So, yeah, you can't get the prosecution for failure to disclose, but you can get them for failure to, for, for deleting evidence and denying all evidence and all that stuff. So you can get your writ of habeas corpus. So, I, you know, so you can be set free. So, you know, the prosecution may have to try this case again, but for the moment, at least, that's the end of our coverage of this case. Thank you so much for being part of the Uncivil Law family. I appreciate your continued support. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to this channel, and you can also support us financially by clicking the applaud button below. Thank you so much for your contributions to our channel. It helps our work grow. Until later, cheers and goodbye.